Two years ago, this December, a murder case that shocked the city of Toronto, the bodies of Barry and Honey Sherman found in their Toronto home. As we look at archives of that scene and of that day, the death shocking, as I said, not just because of the way they were killed, but because of the profile of this couple in the community. Barry Sherman, the billionaire, the multi-billionaire founder of Apotex Pharmaceuticals, one of the richest people in Canada. His wife, Honey, a philanthropist who was involved with numerous charities. And now a new book on the case is out as of today, written by Kevin Donovan, whom you know well from his bylines, chief investigative reporter for the Toronto Star, and now the author of The Billionaire Murders, The Mysterious Deaths of Barry and Honey Sherman. As I said, the book out today. Kevin, my guest today, and it's great to see you. Thank you very much for coming in. Such an important word to include in your title, I think, mysterious. This case continues to both grip and, you know, entrance, really enthrall people in the city because it's two years on unsolved. Yeah, it's a, it's a very sad story, but it's also a classic whodunit. Well, tell me a little bit about it because uh, we're going to be reading it all. I've read all of the excerpts that I found so far published in your paper. But from thinking for people who haven't followed it along as you have all these years, take us back to two years ago nearly. Remind us who Barry and Honey Sherman are and the circumstances of their deaths, first of all. Well, uh, Barry Sherman is a, a brilliant uh, man who founded a company called Apotex, which uh, is manufactures and sells generic pharmaceuticals. Uh, he's a, a billionaire. Um, his, his wife, Honey Sherman, uh, along with uh, Barry, are philanthropists. They, they give away millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to charities and also to small... Uh, small little gifts here and there to to children of friends for example so so nice people uh, they uh, uh, leave their their um, uh, his office they had a meeting at his office on the Wednesday this is uh, December of December 13 uh, Wednesday December 13th and on the Friday their bodies are discovered by a realtor going through the house their house is for sale they're found in a it's a, a macabre uh, scene uh, there there it appears to be uh, in my opinion staged uh, they're sitting uh, uh, with belts looped around their neck uh, uh, which are tied to a railing above their head, uh, and they are, uh, they're dead. Uh, Barry uh, looks almost in repose, uh, glasses perched neatly on his, on his nose. Honey has some damage to her face of some sort, uh, and their legs are stretched out in front. And this is in the pool room, uh, the lap pool of their house that they rarely go to. At the time, I remember the reporting was um, that the investigation was operating under the premise that it had been a murder-suicide, that Barry Sherman had killed his wife, as you said, maybe some damage on her face. Um, why did police believe that? And then conversely, why did the family refuse to believe that? Well, I mean, the, the police uh, said that first night, we're not looking for outstanding suspects. There's been no sign of forced entry. And they said that a couple of times mm -hmm. at, at, the, at the crime scene. Uh, police then uh, went down this uh, uh, a bit of tunnel vision, I would say, looking at the murder-suicide that Barry had killed Honey and then killed himself. Uh, the family was outraged by this. Uh, they, they did not uh, believe this is possible. And, and, and uh, equally importantly, good friends, really good friends of the Sherman said that's not possible. They also said that you know he's in the pharmaceutical business if he was going to kill himself probably would have used drugs that would have been easily accessible uh, they hired a private uh, detective uh, a team uh, a forensic pathologist uh, who uh, did a second set of autopsies and came up with a conclusion uh, based on uh, his m much greater experience than the police pathologist he came up with the uh, diagnosis that this was a targeted double murder uh, at the Toronto Star, we got onto this. We published a front page story. Right. And then a couple of days later, the police went and interviewed the second pathologist, who, by the way, they could have interviewed uh, earlier, Prior. but they didn't. Uh, and, uh, and then they came out with an announcement, a uh, big press conference that many of us, uh, including CBC, it attended. This is a, du a double, homicide. double homicide. One of the excerpts that the Toronto Star has published focuses on this second autopsy, how, how it was performed, and what it learned. Can you just give you a little bit more detail about what it was that was discovered that time? under even more difficult circumstances to do a, a second autopsy on a body where one has already been performed, yeah, the, but what it was revealing. The first autopsy found that a bone that we all have in our neck called the hyoid bone was not broken. And that was uh, that can be indicative of a, of a suicide because uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an actual murder, uh, one would assume that there's a lot of force applied. Uh, uh, and in a suicide, that's not the case. Uh, but the second pathologist had actually done a paper many years before an academic paper that showed that 
the hyoid bone does not have to be broken if a soft ligature uh, is used, such as a belt in this case. Okay, so that was sort of a determinant factor that led to a double homicide, and from there it's continued to flow. I'm listening to some of the language that you're using, tunnel vision, when you describe the police investigation. Again, another of the excerpts that's been published in your paper really raises questions about how Toronto police handled this. What, what are the main issues that have been raised in terms of how this stunning murder was treated in the earliest and most crucial stages? Well, in the first couple of days, uh, the police, uh, uh, there's two batches of video tape that I think would be quite important to look at right away. And you'd want your detectives looking at that. In the movies, Any security they're looking video at you it right away. Find. Okay. So they, uh, the, across the street from the Shermans uh, is, uh, is homeowners who offered police uh, video. Police took a couple of days to actually collect the video, but when they do collect it, uh, as I report in, in the book and in the Toronto Star, they didn't look at it for six weeks. Uh, Barry Sherman and his wife uh, and some architects are leaving Apotex uh, on the Wednesday. There's a lot of video cameras around a, a generic pharmaceutical company. Uh, the police do go in and quite appropriately seize an enormous amount of video. Uh, they don't look at it for six weeks. Uh, and it's incompatible with the system that they have in the end. So that's what, that's how it. they discover it. But okay. So then they call up Apotex and say, we need to uh, you know, get a different version of it. Like We're all familiar with difficulty trying to get sure. something on our computers. Uh, and then go ahead eight, eight months. I've interviewed people who say that they were with the Shermans that day, a personal trainer other people uh, who you know, massage therapists and they say they were not approached for eight months to have their fingerprint and DNA taken and the important of that is you want to exclude people who were just there because they were you know giving a massage or doing uh, personal training. Barry and Honey did a lot of uh, physiotherapy. Uh, Honey uh, enjoyed it more than Barry did. He, he just kind of walked through it if he could. Uh, and so eight months later they're not collecting that information. But I do think that the police are, you know, two years on, uh, are, are now in a grip of the investigation and it's moving in the right direction. Well, well, let's talk about where things stand. I mean, CBC News approached Toronto Police for comment and what they said was the Sherman investigation remains active. We will not be commenting further on the ongoing investigation. So this, this is not yet a cold case. They're still actively on it? Yes, uh, and so uh, with the support of the Toronto Star, I've been going back uh, to the police and trying to get information through a court process where we're trying to obtain documents. And so I'm uh, given the opportunity to cross-examine one of the detectives on the case. Uh, and so what uh, that detective has told me is the following. Uh, they have a working theory, which is an idea of what happened. They won't say if there is a suspect or person of interest. I'm pretty sure there must be, because how can you have a theory without a suspect? Uh, and perhaps most importantly, they've just completed analysis of a major amount of electronic information that they seized from a production order. I don't know what this information is. I'm speculating that it's some sort of GPS locational information, something they needed to have the real uh, uh, top people analyze. They got that report on September 6th. Uh, the detective told me uh, just a couple weeks ago that in court that they are quote, cautiously optimistic that, you know, they're getting closer to a resolution. So to me, that's, that's, that's months, not years. Okay, month, so you're saying that it looks like indications are this will be solved at some point in the relatively near future? Well, and I'm basing that on what this detective right. says. I mean, uh, I, I, he's under oath. I think he's telling me the truth. Uh, he's not saying that this is something that is going to be investigated for many years. Uh, he's saying that they're in the process of getting more uh, search warrants and production orders. I think that's probably happening, like, you know, could be even happening right now. Uh, and quote, again, cautiously optimistic. And so I feel that there's going to be some sort of a resolution, uh, you know, potentially a charge mm -hmm. sometime in the next few months. And do you have, based on your investigation and your probes, which are always so exhaustive, do you have an idea of where this may lead? Uh, I, I do have uh, have an idea. Uh, it's not something that I'm going to share publicly, but I, I have a, uh, okay. a general idea and I'm still investigating. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to the next installments. In the meantime, as of today, the book is out. Well worth your time. As, a, as we've said, this is a case that has absolutely been a preoccupation in much of the city for a long time, continues to be. And Kevin, thank you very very much Thank for you. coming in. Kevin Donovan is the chief investigative reporter for the Toronto Star. You saw his book cover. Maybe we can show you it again. It's called The Billionaire Murders, The Mysterious Deaths of Barry and Honey Sherman. This is CBC News Network.